Hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, Tropical Plant Party. Never gonna guess where I am. Oh, big shocker. I uh, came here because I need to get some tubing to hook a fountain up, and uh, big surprise, just like me being at Lowe's, I didn't bring my piece of tube with me. I thought I did, but nope, nope, didn't do it. So I'm just gonna do the dumbest thing, which you should never do when buying tubing or plumbing supplies or anything, is just, I'm just gonna guess. <laughs> just hope I buy the right size. Is what I'm thinking, or what I'm wanting to do, the whole plan, the whole reason I'm here, is because I have that, remember those fountains I got over the summer? Got them really cheap from Michael's, well I think I only showed one of them, but I got two. And I thought it would be fun to actually set those up in the grow space, like may as well use them year round, right? Okay, my ass almost just got taken out by the security truck. Yeah, so I just wanted to get some more tubing so I can run it into the pond and not have it in the basin. Know what I mean? Does that make any sense? No? Yes, maybe? Uh-oh. Uh-oh. We can look at the plants. I should try and find the tubing first, though. But I want to look at the plants. I see clearance things. That's exciting. Oh, and it's seed time. Kind of. Almost. Depends on what you're growing. I need to whip out my seed catalogs. They've been coming in the mail, but I haven't really been paying attention to them. I either need a quarter, five sixteenths, or three eighths. Be sure to save that receipt and these things, because I'm still working on my drip setup. Are these actually the right size? I don't trust it. Never go into the hardware store thinking that just because that's what it says right there, that that's what's in there, because you can look. These aren't, those don't belong in there. I've gotten home so many times and been like, hey, what happened? Why did I buy that? It's because things weren't where they were supposed to be. Okay, I need a valve too, but that's really expensive, so I might just have to hold off, wait for Amazon, do something with that, because $10 for a valve, no way. Hey, some cute little air plants over here. I like that they're in these little containers, hold the moisture in form a little bit better, so people don't buy them when they're all dried up and dead. Is this an autumn fern? It is. Oh, it's pretty too. I love the glossy foliage. It's nice ferns. That's cute. They have a whole bunch of the little guys. They look good too. And I was surprised down here. They got some of those little lime or limelight dracenias. Yes, limelight. Yeah. I like the limelight a lot. It's a very bright and vibrant dracenia. Oh. And the curly chlorophyte on Roll over by no? Okay. What are you doing? I see you. She is very wound up. Also, abrupt transition, I know. There was a mother at Lowe's, and she had a couple of children that were just screaming their heads off. I felt very bad for her. But I thought, you know what? I doubt anybody wants to hear that. You want it? Go get it. Go on. There we go. But uh, yeah, I didn't think anybody would want to listen to that. I know I didn't, so I just went ahead and was like, yeah, I'm going to stop recording now. Pumpkin, why are you so blurry? This camera's a piece of crap. Right, we'll try again, Pumpkin. Ready? Go. Go get it. Yeah, chase those cookies down. I need to go ahead and get this Christmas stuff put away. Uh, it's been a minute. I said I'd get it done, so I'll go ahead and do it. But I'm glad to have it done. That's for sure. I still have the poinsettias and things over in here that are looking like they're about ready to be cut back. I need to go ahead and give those a trim. This one over here is not doing too bad. This one, though, yeah, I think it needs a prune. The uh, little fiddle. I went ahead and pulled that ugly Christmas sweater sweater off the pot and I need to repot this. That's something I'll probably do fairly soon. At the very least though, I did notice the leaves are kind of dusty. So I'm gonna give that a bit of a wipe down. Okay, there's something I can check off my list. And so now I have more space to bring some more of the plants in. I keep a lot of things out in the garage until after Christmas because the window gets very full of all of the Christmas things. And the poinsettias, when they're done, which, like I said, this one right here just about is, when it's time to give that its cut back, I'll move that actually out to the garage. It's just going to be green leaves, not a lot to look at, so no reason to keep that out here. Hey, and look, now I'm outside, jumping all over the place this week, which is 
Okay, so I wasn't even sure if I was going to have a vlog up this weekend. Right now, I am putting out the little ant traps that I use. It is really important to try and control the ants if you, I mean, period. And there are issues with other pests like mealybugs, aphids, even whitefly. Those are all soft-bodied pests that their excrement's called honeydew. It's like a sticky sap that comes out of them. And ants love it. They love it to the point where they'll actually farm. Like, mealybugs, they'll grab them and gather them and help protect them and then perpetuate the issue of having mealybug problems. And if you're new here, you may not know, I have been battling mealybugs for years out here from one little Clarence Calathea I brought home from Home Depot. And ever since then, just... And I've tried everything. You can leave your suggestions down there. I appreciate it. But with the exception of some very harsh chemicals... I've tried, like, pretty much everything that I've seen out there. And there are things that work better than others, but for the most part, what I've figured is I really just have to do spot sprays with... I use just a natural spray that I'll show you in a minute. I just have to go through and do that occasionally. But back to the ants. So uh, I like to use these taro liquid ant bait stakes, and it says right there, outdoors. See that? outdoors so i can't recommend other people use these in their house plants in the house because that's wrong it says not to do that but i do it anyways i'm not outdoors but I'm like outdoors ish i don't know not really i'm just i'm being bad and breaking rules they're just these little stakes you take this tab off right here snap it off and plop it down into the soil and i usually do this in a manner so that that hole that's right here is facing away from where I usually water. Uh, that's because out here when I'm watering I tend to use the hose and spray from further away instead of going to each plant individually. I do that with spot watering but not with my typical watering so that way the water doesn't flush in there and wash everything out. They do have ones made for indoor use and there are lots of just different brands of ant baits that work really well. The slug and bug stuff from not proven winners who is it? You know, Espoma? Yeah, Espoma. People say that works very well. I've tried it. Didn't work for me, but that could just be the type of ants that I have out here. But here's an example of what happens if you're not careful. See those? See all those little, all those little ants moving around up there? They were inside my Shari baby, my Oncidium orchid right there. So that's, you know, I didn't have a trap a little bait station set up for them on top of the table because I don't want those chemicals getting in the water. So uh, they're freaking out because I watered the orchid and now they're abandoning ship and moving back there into that a la Kaja that's back there. So I'm going to let them do that. I'm going to continue to water the plants. They keep leaving and uh, make sure I get those bait stations set up back there. I try and have them in just about all of the plants. They're a little bit pricey so it's hard to pull that off but I, in like 75% of them that's what I'm trying to do this year. And it is helping, but this little spot back here got away from me <laughs> because I didn't... I thought I had, like, a nice little island here, but you can kind of see where there's leaves touching the sides right there. What was I pointing to? Right there. See? There. And that makes a little bridge for them. So I was thinking it wasn't an issue, but then, you know, it's just brain fart. It happens. Also important to keep the surface of the soils free of debris. Don't want leaves and too much clutter collecting on top of there because that just gives the ants a place to play. Things break down and they enjoy getting into all those nooks and crannies and just it causes problems and it looks better, right? There are lots of other reasons to keep the surface of the soil free from too much debris. It's not just the ants, obviously. There's bacterial breakdowns and fungus and other things that can be attracted. Once a week when I'm doing waterings and checking things out and spraying, I like to go through and here and there. I don't do it like all at one time. That would just be too much, but I try and make sure to, if I see a pot full of leaves, and to obviously get that out of there. And I just push those stakes down in there and that's it. Pretty easy. Yeah. And if you didn't know what I should have talked about when I started talking about the bait stations, the way these work is they have an attractant in it. The ants that go out to collect food, take that attractant back to the ant hive and eventually it makes its way to the queen and kind of stops the whole ant process and that's only when these work sometimes these things are hit or miss but i've had fairly good luck with them and i think that when i haven't had them work well that that was probably more than likely because i didn't use enough of them there are a lot of plants out here right so if i only put out like i don't know i'd say six of them just like one pack of them could very 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 easily miss like an ant hive inside one of the pots so i'm stepping it up with these this year and it's helping. 
but it's still, I mean, there's still ants. It's just kind of part of it. I can't eradicate them, and I really like ants. Really just killing the bugs in general is kind of a bummer, and I'm not really into it, but have to in order to control the mealy bugs. If you don't control the mealy bugs, then you lose the plants. So sort of a vicious cycle. And here are some other products that I have been trying out and using. I figured, I was like, you know, why not just grab them all. All the safe ones are the ones that claim to be safe. So uh, these two, the uh, Captain Jack's Dead Bug and the Super Soap have Spinosad in it, which is pretty effective for getting rid of bugs on contact. All of these are on contact, but with all of them, you have to really saturate the area. So I've been going through and making sure that when I actually spray the mealy bugs that I see that white coating on them turn kind of gray. Mealy bugs have a waxy coating and it repels a lot of the sprays and whatever you use on them so you have to fully saturate in order for it to work and what i've been using the most and really liking the most is actually this dr earth final stop there is one thing about it that drives me absolutely crazy and it's the top when you go to spray this i mean look at it just it swivels all over the place when you're spraying it and it that can get kind of annoying it's a little bit too loose whereas these you know it's thick so you can hold it in your hand more steadily and control your stream this it's a little bit more difficult that part's kind of annoying what i like about this one is actually more about the ingredients it has the rosemary oil sesame oil peppermint oil thyme you can see it right here it smells okay i don't like using neem because it just i can't stand the smell it drives me absolutely nuts i think it stinks i gives me headaches sometimes so i do avoid using neem when uh, something is bad enough that I want to use neem, I make sure to get like a nice cold pressed neem, usually off of Amazon, something like that. But peppermint oil has always been one of my go-tos for like a homemade spray for something that you need to work on contact. It's great for spiders, which I don't really spray for spiders very often. I have like a bit of an issue with the cellar spiders in my basement. So I've been spraying a little bit because those go absolutely out of control in no time, kind of like my hand there. But this is essentially something like that, but pre-made. So works fairly well, but like I said, I have to go through and actually make sure that it's in contact with those bugs. So I have to do it often. I'm, like I think I maybe said, I'm trying to stay in a routine of at least once a week going through, going into all the plants over behind everything and in front of everything. And if I see the mealies, then spray them. And with the areca palms, I'm making sure to spray it down into these crevices along the crown shaft there, because that's where I've noticed the mealybugs really like to hide out. And I avoid getting plants now that I know the mealybugs like, with the exception of the cordelin fruticosas, which I do have several of those. Mealybugs love those plants. Coleus, the mealybugs love. And uh, what's the other one that I used to love and I stopped growing? them? Oh, Hoyas. The, I just, I can't with the Hoyas. They always end up just infested. Which might actually be useful, though, right? Because if you think about it, if you have a particular type of plant that the mealybugs flock to, then you have them all in one place to so spray them down and get rid of them. And I have tried that with Coleus and some other things, and it didn't, it didn't really work out. But it does make it a little bit easier to spray. And this product right here that I was talking about... I really have noticed that when I spray those mealies down with them, that the next day I leave them where they are, I don't flush them out completely, that they're dead. Whereas I have used some of these others, and it just it doesn't quite do it. Not always. Sometimes it does. That's probably a lot of user error, actually. But so far using the things that are just derived of like natural oils seems to be working really well. Another reason that I really like this spray is that because of the ingredients that are in it, basically just being essential oils, I know that if I need to go through and just spray things down once or twice a week just to be sort of preventative, but that's okay. It's not gonna hurt anything too much. So there's the mealybug update that Nobody asked for. You're welcome. Oh, and I'm not going to say that this smells good, because it doesn't, but to me it smells better than neem. And actually, some people may like the way it smells. It has a little bit of a spicy scent to it that I'm not crazy about. I really just need to order more peppermint oil. I love spraying the peppermint oil on the plants. It smells so good. There used to be a product, I think it was from Garden Safe a few years ago. They sold it at Lowe's. That's where I used to get it from. And it smelled so good. I think it was peppermint oil and uh, lemongrass. And I think there's like one or two other things in there. I loved that product. It smelled nice. It smelled kind of like root beer to me. And 
my nose. That's how I always interpreted the smell. And it worked so wonderfully. I mostly use it for spiders. Because sometimes during the summer, the spiders get kind of out of control in the gravel drainage that's by the pool. And then the pool gets full of spiders running across it. It's pretty much the only time outdoors that I do anything for spiders. And that's another one where it kills on contact. So it's more just like maybe every couple months I would go through and spray that gravel area down just to help control the population a little bit because they it gets pretty intense. I have also noticed the mealybugs have taken a liking to this heliconia, which I don't remember them being into those before, but it's all right. I've been spraying it and then they go away. So it's staying under control for now. Typically though, it's like February when all of a sudden it's like they're just everywhere, mostly on the Eureka palms. So that's just what I've been talking about. I'm just going to have to stay on top of going through and keeping them sprayed down. That's the only thing I can think of aside from using harsh chemicals, which I'm just, I'm not going to do. And then one other thing that I think I'm going to give a try since this Oncidium back here, since that seems to be ground zero for a lot of the ants, I will probably go ahead and let that dry out some more. Not to a point where it's going to hurt the orchid, but the ants will return. This is actually one of the few plants that I tried with the slug and bug getter stuff I was talking about earlier from Espoma. And I had sprinkled it around the top of the bark. Uh, I can't really say how well it worked. I mean, y'all just saw what was going on there. That was months ago, though. So I can't really judge the product based off of that. That wouldn't be fair. But what I will do, since that seems to be where a lot of them are and are coming from, I will go ahead, let that dry out, like I just said, and pull it from the shelf. I'll put it in a trash bag and then... Uh, water it down heavily, maybe even do a full-on drench all the way to the surface of the soil with a diluted peroxide. If you use hydrogen peroxide, mix that in with your water, that does tend to kill off a lot of the critters and the bugs. And just like for a little while, you know, 20 minutes, something like that, pull it out, give it a really good flush and see if that helps. Because I know the ants fleed, they went all the way over and backed into that alakaja, but I'm pretty confident they're going to come back because they always really like this on Sidium. So that might be a really good way to just kind of handle things in bulk. And that I know nobody asked. I'm just kind of thinking out loud here. There have been some other things going on out here. I need to keep an eye on this. I'm refilling it because like I said, I water with this throughout the week with the other plants when I'm not doing heavy drenchings. But I moved all my bubblers down along the side so it's, there aren't as many like rapids in here. And I think that the water lily is appreciating that. You can see how long and stretched some of those lily pads were getting there. And I would say that that's probably because the current was incredibly strong. It didn't drop any, which I am absolutely shocked by. I really figured that it would start to drop its pads with the water moving as much as it was, but it didn't. So that's good news. And I really mostly, the, those air stones, they really just need to be down at this end down here anyways, because that's where I have all my humidity lovers, or as Pam's Pretty Plants calls them, her humidity hose, which I love that, my humidity hose. They're all hanging out over here. So that's where those bubbles will pop. And they seem to be enjoying it, that anthurium, like within, a, I'd say a week. It's probably just a coincidence, but you can see it started flowering. There's a bud up there above my finger. And so, yeah, that's all good news. One thing I did want to talk about very quickly. Yes, every single video the past few weeks, someone asked me, is it a Prince of Orange? That is a Prince of Orange. It's just, it's pretty. It's one of my favorite philodendrons. You get lots of nice, vibrant color out of it without having to spend a fortune. I'm thinking uh, I need to, like, completely rearrange these shelves. They've gotten ordered in an odd manner that doesn't make any sense, like the begonias are tucked all the way back here when they should be closer to the front and it just it doesn't really make any sense but the thing is i think i'm going to like change it up drastically i'm going to bring all the tropicals over here move all the succulents to that side over there and just kind of like do a big whole like swap out sort of thing so i'm gonna hold off on that just for a couple days i have this guy in here the seneseo is just growing like crazy. It's all the way tucked back in here. It's that little bitty plant growing all the way up and through there. Didn't think it would be quite that vigorous. When I've grown these before, they got big and they were pretty vigorous, but this one, it was just like out of nowhere, just poof, 
exploded with growth, which I love. Um, that is a uh, Senecio macroglossus. You can see the main plant over here. I think it's called a variegated wax ivy. It's not an ivy, it's a succulent. Really cool plants though. Very easy to grow. You get that kind of ivy appearance without having to mess with ivy. I know, sometimes ivy can be a little bit tricky depending on the environment for people. Yep, how about a poblano update? Yeah, there they go, They're getting those fruit. I'm surprised. I really wasn't expecting that with them being indoors. I have been watching out for spider mites and stuff like that because the leaves got kind of dull and dotted, you see that? And uh, so there may have been some sort of insect thing going on. That's what led me to get going with the spray. Like I was talking about to make sure that everything was getting hit with a horticultural oil or some sort of oil period to make sure that any mites or bugs are getting smothered out. Because with pretty much any edible, that can be a major problem when growing them indoors. White flies and fungus gnats and spider mites and whatnot. And uh, this could also just be from it going, getting too dry and then watering and too dry and then watering if the plant cells can rupture from that happening. And uh, uh, nutrients. I haven't, I really haven't fertilized it. But, but I, I don't I don't I haven't fertilized it one time, so that also could have a lot to do with the dull, discolored, kind of floppy, sad leaves. I should go ahead and fertilize that. I just really wasn't expecting it to grow or do anything. I was like, eh, it's a pepper. Seems like a long shot. They need a lot of light, but it's so far seems pretty good. It seems happy. I fruta casa the Singapore. You really can't see it from here. Well, it's flowering. I wanted to show it off. I need to put a zip door back here because it's gotten really hard to get i guess i could it's not hard i'll do we'll, we'll put up a little zip door sometimes things are a little bit stuttery and weird because i don't the things aren't planned I'm just going with the flow I'm just along for the right right yeah see it's a little bit difficult to get in through right here there is one zipper already in but there's a fresh sheet of plastic behind that that needs a zipper. So I'm gonna see if I can find one. I know I have one somewhere. I'm pretty sure I've done this here before, but it's just like an adhesive on the back of a zipper and you get it started. And I usually just pull a little section and then press it in. There's this little tool with a couple blades in it. You poke that in and just drag it down. And just like that, I have my little zipper door. My back entrance over here to the plants. But there it is, there's what I <laughs> that's the whole point why I wanted to get back here. The Singapore Twist Cordelin Fruticasa. Looking good. Look at those flowers. Aren't they cute? I'm actually it's kind of blurry. Let me come back. Thing kind of obnoxious about this camera is that when you have like the internal stabilization turn up really high, the picture's not as good. It's like overcompensating with pixels and just doesn't look good, so sometimes I'm gonna turn that off, but things might be a little bit more shaky, but it's a much better look at them. Just cute little dainty flowers. I am looking forward to hopefully getting some seeds out of this and getting those growing. Maybe because I haven't seen the Singapore twist around that often. It's been one that a little bit harder to find for me in the past, but another plant that the mealybugs absolutely love. That's another reason I needed to go ahead and get this zipper situation handled here so I can get back here a little bit more easily because now that I have my queen palms in here, it's not as easy to crawl around the back edge of this plastic and get in here. So that's it. Quick, easy, easy solution. And before I forget, <laughs> dump the fertilizer all over the ground. Just throwing a slow release in there. I have some uh, like organic vegetable fertilizer that I think I would prefer for something like this, but uh, the problem with the organic like soil amendment type fertilizers is that they really attract bugs like big time. Not a big problem outdoors, but I just think that if I were to put like a like an Espoma Biotone in here, or Plant Tone, or I, it was actually the Job's Tomato Fertilizer. That's what I have some of. If I were to put the amount in here that would be necessary for the pepper, I just I think that it would just become overrun with fungus gnats and other things. So I'm just going to do a little bit of all-purpose slow-release fertilizer, get that amended in to the top of the soil, and then I will maybe do just like a tiny tiny sprinkling of the tomato fertilizer but i think i'll go ahead and just hit it with a liquid all purpose that makes more sense doesn't it i think so that's the jobs the vegetable and tomato fertilizer i really like that stuff 
this stuff. I use it mostly with things like um, cactus and succulents, actually. But it's also great for the tomatoes and vegetables. But for now, I'm just going to use an all-purpose 2020-20. Because I just put the slow release in there. So you don't need to go too overboard with things. Now, I have used this a fair amount indoors and haven't had tons of bug problems like I have with other organic soil amend type fertilizers. So I will give it that. It is pretty good stuff. But like I said, I also mostly have been using it with succulents and cactus too, which are plants that have a drier soil. So uh, you tend to not have as many uh, fungus gnat issues with a drier soil. The pepper, I'm, I'm, I let the soil dry out in between waterings, not like totally and also not always intentionally. Sometimes it just kind of happens, but it, it, it's, it's a pepper. It's a fruiting plant. It's producing produce, so it needs a lot more water than a cactus. For a while, I was being really good about fertilizing every single time I watered. That was something I wanted to do this year. Like, every single time I watered. With the water that comes out of the pond over here, that water always has extra nutrients in it, which is wonderful because there's fish in there. There's also a water lily in there, which they are nutrient hogs, so the water's probably not as full and dense with nutrients as it used to be. Since I'm not watering as much with the pond water, I'm trying to make sure to use all purpose just in like a quarter dose every time I water. I just, since the holidays, I kind of forgot about it. Usually I use a chopstick to stir this up, but I don't know where it is. I'm using a glue stick. Probably not the best idea, but I'll just make sure to not put this glue stick in the glue gun. It's probably fine. <laughs> but also, maybe not. This is a bad idea. I should have just looked harder for the chopstick. When I say I couldn't find my chopsticks, I'm going to hold myself accountable here. I looked for half a second and the, the glue stick was closer. So that's not, shouldn't really say I, you can't find something that you don't really look for. Has that ever happened with you where you're like, oh, I can't find it. And then you realize that like you didn't, you didn't really look that hard. Could have put a little bit more effort into it. There's the chop that was, it was right next to where I picked the glue stick up from. Eh, whatever. Oh, and I put a very, very small amount of fertilizer in this because like I said, I want to be sure to use a little bit every time I fertilize and I just put that slow release in there. So I don't need to do too much. This basil's very thirsty. Oh, right. I'm supposed to, you don't know what's happening. Hold on. I had told myself that I need to lay off on the watering on the top shelves for both of these over here because they need to dry out because I need to pull the plants off of them and I don't want to be messing with the light fixtures or anything if there's water dripping all over the place. So I don't actually have time for that this week because the, the vlog's supposed to be out in like five hours. The things got away from me. They didn't really. Last night was Friday and I did Friday night things. So oops. I'm not going to let them dry out and be thirsty, though, so everything should still get a little drink. Just don't want to fully saturate them, because while th this video's going through the computer, while that's processing and everything after it's been edited, I'll probably work on this, actually. Because that's something I think would be fun to get done, and I found... Hold on. Let me... Just give me a second. I'll be right back. Look how I say things like hold on in a video that you know is going to be edited, so that's unnecessary. I found these nice long totes at Walmart, and I think that these will work really, really well for the same purpose as this. I think it's called like a mud tote. It's for like boots and things like that. And it's basically the same price. And it's more shallow, so it'll do... I'll explain all that. I... The, I started the other video, which I shouldn't be doing right now. I need to finish this one. I'm trying to think if there's anything else to update. Oh, one thing I didn't mention with the oil that I really like is look at how naturally shiny it makes everything. It's not naturally, it's added there from the oils, but this uh, Fruitland Corti... 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 <laughs> Who are you? Fruitland Fruticosa Harlequin. That's the variety of this one. It has this nice sheen to it from that spray. It's actually probably beneficial when it comes to things like spider mites, which these are prone to. I mean, you know, most of the house plants are prone to spider mites, but the cordolins, I've just noticed these fruticasas, mealybugs, spider mites, they love these plants. They just dig right in. So I've been trying to stay on top of like, there's some kind of weird little egg situation going on there. So having the oil kind of coating the leaves, that that will help with spider mites, but it's not really, I don't think, going to do anything for mealybugs because it's not like this stuff that's on here is 
any sort of toxin. So when the plants bite it, or the plants, when the bugs bite into the foliage, it's not like they're going to ingest something that's going to kill them. But uh, it will help with the mites because it's going to be a little bit harder for them to get through it. And uh, mites are small enough that that oily coating on here should help to kind of coat the mites and sort of suffocate them out. That's the point with those horticultural oils. I feel like nothing is in focus. Could also be because I need to change my contacts out. <laughs> oh, I was supposed to move these outside this week to get them into their dormancy. I, you know, this is my last week of staycation and I just, I was really busy leisuring and not doing things that I should have been doing. So that's another thing I've screwed up this week. It's all right. It's not the end of the world. I need my bucket here. Oh, I've been looking everywhere for the tip to that watering can. It was in there with this parlor palm the entire time. I've had this parlor palm sitting in that bucket because it needs a lot of water. This is a very thirsty plant and it's just easier to just keep it in a bucket. But I need the bucket right now to use for that. And there's my, I found my tip. See, this is what I was referring to by the tip. I took that spout off of here a while ago. I can't remember why. Actually, I think it might be because the spout like really just kind of stinks. This is a really cheap watering can. It just kind of converges there in a way that I don't really like. And part of that's because it just, it has this little short spout on it, which makes watering the shelves over here. It's, I'm pretty sure that that's exactly why I took that spout off. It just makes it hard to get in there without making a mess. But now I at least remember why I took it off and it still would be useful to have when watering everything else. I need to just get another watering can, one with a longer spout on it. I have one that has a pretty long spout on it, but the hole's just really tiny. It has a tiny, tiny little hole in the top and it's a pain in the butt to fill up. Okay, back to how this entire thing started. I can't, I need to, excuse, things are very jungly in here. Why is this my life? And I go, oh yeah, because you absolutely love it. There we go. So just set that right there and kind of let it drain out. It's going to take a while. And then uh, I think I will actually do a whole different video with this because it would be easier to kind of track the progress and how it works and everything. So, hey, at least I got it started. And there's like two things left I want to talk about. I got some new plants. I don't need to always do the plant hauls, but just look, look at how pretty they are. These are variegated bird's nest ferns, and I... I'm absolutely obsessed with them. They are from Hawaii. They were shipped from Hawaii, so I need to repot them into something that's a bit more practical for where I live. You know, the bird's nest ferns, they're okay with drying out to an extent, but I have noticed anytime I've gotten in plants from Hawaii and um, Costa Rica that they tend to be in a mix that dries so, so, so fast that it's not, doesn't really fit my environment. It makes sense for Hawaii and Costa Rica because of the precipitation and humidity and whatnot, but I don't really have that here. It's much more dry. So they need to go into something that is a bit more moisture retentive because these are bone dry and I've been absolutely soaking them and still bone dry. But like I said, though, they're bird's nest ferns, so they can take it. Look at that foliage, though. Look at it. They are absolutely gorgeous. I can tell that, like, the older foliage doesn't really have anywhere near as much of the variegation, or I guess that that would be the younger foliage. So it's older, but the full. So the foliage that the plant produces when it's younger. Did it get it? That makes sense. So I'm interested to see as these grow how that variegation holds up. I've always wanted these though, and I just, I found them on eBay and I was like, you know what? Treat yourself. A lot of the times when I get plants, they're for like a project or an activity or a craft or something like that. I mean, or, you know, just because I want them. I don't think they're like super rare, which is fine. That has nothing to do with why I like them. I don't think I've ever wanted a plant because of its rarity. It's, it's if I like the plant, then I like it, regardless of whether it's rare or common. That, hasn't really been a factor for me before. From what I've seen though, they're relatively easy to find. They seem to kind of come and go though, like they're not always available and it's just, I've been seeing them around for a while and I'm just, look at it, look at that. It's absolutely stunning. I cannot wait to see what these look like as they get bigger, when they turn into nice, big, bulky bird's nest ferns. That variegation is just going to be absolutely stunning. It already is stunning. 
It's so pretty. I have spent so much time just staring at these. It's not the same on every single leaf. You can see there, there's some variation there with the variegation. Some are more white and some are more green. Very simple, single level variegation. Just stunning though. So I need to repot those. They are on the top of my list for repottings actually. I have these, my Peperomia, Obtusifolia, that needs a repot, and a few others, which reminds me, I need to go outside and I have a bag of soil sitting out there because it just, it hasn't been that cold, so I didn't bother bringing it in, but it that needs to come inside now. Yeah, it's this Fox Farm soil. It's one of those things that's just been sitting out here, and I walk past it and I just keep forgetting to move it inside. I don't like to leave things out when it's cold and wet and just doesn't and the bugs get into the soil and whatnot the thing is like fox farm why did you make this bag stupid it's shaped in such an odd awkward way that it's not the easiest thing to carry around it's also wet so extra heavy right now i mean there is some appeal to it that's <laughs> my brother-in-law mountain dew for christmas and it's still here I need to make sure he gets that the thing with the bag though like it is nice in the sense that you can just cut this top off and it's standing up for you. That part, kind of cool, but carrying it is just really awkward. I still have my mule palms outside. It has been such a mild winter, with the exception of November. November was absolutely freezing and frigid, but it, otherwise it hasn't been too bad. There was a brief spell in December where I moved them in for a few days, but they're doing great. These guys have gone down to the single digits very briefly before. Very, very, very brief. It was just a few hours. Typically, I make sure they come in. I don't like for them to go below 20. They're potted, so they're going to be less hardy. But they've gone into the teens many times. And heck, at one point this year, they back in December, they got frozen to the ground. And I couldn't get them inside until I had someone help me. And they were covered. I mean, frozen solid. They had icicles hanging from them. And uh, there's minimal damage to the foliage from that. You can see there's a little bit of burning, but not too bad considering it was down into the teens and they were covered with ice for a fairly decent amount of time. And they've done a lot of growing. They enjoyed the repot that they got back in the spring that was in one of the vlogs and they absolutely just flushed out with new growth. They loved it. I do tend to, with my hardy palms, I kind of I push them. I generally, I kind of coddle them for a couple of years and then every year leave them out a little bit longer and let them see a little bit more cold every single year. And now that it's been several years, these were only maybe two feet tall when I got them. They still had strap leaves on them. They were tiny little things. But at this point, you can see they've gotten, they're pretty big now. Uh, they can take an awful, awful lot of cold. And they're different hybrids within the mule palms, different varieties where people mix in different forms of the Butia capitata, the same thing with the queen palms, there's the Latoris and things like that. So there's different plant genes that can be influential with their hardiness, but otherwise just fabulous plants. The same thing over here with like my windmill palms, I tend to push them a little bit too. And I've had them long enough now where they can take a very, very, very good amount of cold. Still, I move them in. It's supposed to drop here into the teens in a few days, and since they're potted, I'll go ahead and bring them in. They would grow faster in the ground, I know, but these and the meal palms, they're just so expensive to get them in a large size. I got these when they were very small, and this is just, that's their growth over the last decade, basically. So it would just, if the enclosure they were in just happened to break during an ice storm or something, that happened. I used to have a pendu palm in the ground for years, if something were to happen and then just kill them, it would be a big loss. So I'm just like, why not just keep them in the pots? They don't grow quite as quickly, but I can move them in and out and have something nice and green out here during the winter time. I find the hardiness of the mule palms much more surprising compared to those windmill palms. So if I had to give like a cutoff temperature, like what's the absolute coldest I will let these see before I bring them in. Since I've had them for several years and I've kind of acclimated them to colder weather, generally I like to make sure that they come in uh, yeah, between 15 and 20 degrees. If there's going to be ice, then just anything below freezing. I just, I would prefer them not to get covered in ice. The ice makes the crown rot a bigger issue, so I do my best to avoid having to worry about that. Or any extreme freezing and thawing, that causes bacterial growth inside the crown. The crown being 
the center of the palm where the fresh spears come out. Freezing and thawing, it encourages bacterial growth. So if it's gonna be like 20 degrees at night, 50 degrees during the day, and do that repeatedly for a while, then sometimes I'll go ahead and move them in just so things are a little bit more stable. But I, that hasn't, I haven't really had any issues with that before. Not with these, they've been pretty solid. More solid than when I was just growing the regular Butia Capitatas, just the Pendos. The, those crown rot very easily. <laughs> if they get too much moisture in the center, they uh, don't do well with it. Whereas these, they have that queen palm gene in them and they're just much more sturdy plants. I absolutely love them. Okay, here's the update that basically nobody asked for. I will probably have to move those in though sometime this week because it looks like the temperatures are going to be doing this a lot, which is, it's mid-January. It's very, I've never had them out this long before. Usually they come in right around Christmas time, just depending. Like I said, I snuck them in in November when we had some bad weather and then they came in a few for a few more days in December, but otherwise they're nice, sturdy solid plant they would the mule palms by far my top recommendation for people who are looking for a hardy palm tree that's that's the way to go they're pricey but oh my gosh they are so tough and they're pretty and they grow quickly just overall great plants and i'm still obsessed with these i can't stop looking at them they're so pretty okay if i don't shut up at some point this video is never going to come out it's gonna, probably not going to be out till like six or seven o'clock if i don't stop talking and get on top of editing and everything so hope everybody's doing well having a great day and a great life my vacation this officially ends it so be back to getting into weekly plant videos and not just the vlogs and whatnot which will be fun i've kind of missed it a little bit it's been a little bit nice to kind of clear my head and let the creativity juices come back to life a little bit and just rest and whatnot but it's like i said the youtube thing is fun i don't really see it as work so i'm excited about that and then to do the terrarium things i haven't intentionally been teasing with that it's just i've been excited about it, so i've been talking about it but i realized to some people that i think it may have been coming across as like teasing about the terrarium videos i have a terrarium video i did last year so if you've been like waiting on a terrarium video that's there it's called like mossy bromeliad fern terrarium i'll link it at the end of the video and um uh, there's serpa designs he like oh my gosh best channel ever for terrariums go check him out he has absolutely everything you could ever want to know and his stuff is beautiful yeah again hope everybody's doing well having a great day great life and everything's just going beautifully for you all my social media is linked down below i'm on instagram more than anything else and you know the youtube drill like subscribe all that fun stuff makes a big difference for the channel i do appreciate it and thank you for it and of course as always and most importantly everybody keep on growing bye bye